All right, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Last time we covered um, four boxes of the in the packet, and we completed um, all the prophets and Allah signs last day. So we're looking at box nine, box ten, seven, and eight. Those are the boxes that we had completed, and congratulations, sisters, for taking the test and actually getting the highest score. So let's continue for now, and we're going to do box 11 and box 12. It's really easy because those, those until now, are pretty straightforward. So we'll we'll get to the deconstructing part um, in, I believe, in boxes, in boxes 15 and 16. Um, that's when things require more attempt. These are pretty straightforward. So let's go um, for 10 or, or box 11. And let's start with um, the issues that relate to Dean. And what it meant that relate to Dean, meaning you know ritual and spirituality. So um, um, matter or affair and umur would be plur plural. But you could see that many times in the Quran, and it appeared 13 times, many times in the Quran, it would be speaking about a great matter. So when we say amr here, we although the word amr can also mean an order, but here uh, many times it will appear as a matter, to just speaking about such matter, such issue. Taqwa, right, appeared 17 times. Taqwa, p, uh, piety, fear or protection. But one thing is when we say taqwa, taqwa, it's usually when you you are very cautious about something. So taqwa would mean extremely cautious and having the fear to transgress. So you are so considerate that you don't want to transgress, transgress the limit because you are so cautious. That's why, or actually, you are so cautious because you fear that you might transgress. So you would be having that taqwa, cautious. And at many times, taqwa would mean like a barrier between you and something. So this is taqwa. And here, they made it for you, the protection, which is what I was talking about, the barrier. And taqwa would mean that you are so cautious, you are so cautious that you have the, you know, religious aware and awakening and awareness that you fear to transgress. So it's a whole sentence. Let's move on. Haq. Haq means truth and right. So when we say true, truth, true and right. And notice that it appeared 247 times, which can tell you that in Islam or in the Quran, it does not consider truth as relative, but in fact, an absolute an absolute issue. So haq, truth and true or right. Okay. Now what is what is the difference between truth and right? Right that relates to when we're speaking about people's rights. All right? People's rights. You don't have that right to do such and such, meaning you don't have the haq to do such and such. But when we speak about truth on its own truth per se, um, then we're actually speaking about the actual truth. We're talking about the actual truth and the and what we mean by truth, which is the opposite of falsehood. And here's Bothan. Bothan is the opposite of falsehood. Now, it's really important to mention that the word batil would simply mean that you're you're voiding something and you're considering it as totally void, meaning totally false. Hikmah would be wisdom. So hikmah would be wisdom. And wisdom is simply to do the, the right thing for the good consequence. So that would be hikmah. And that's why even when we speak to youth, we always say your parents would have more hikmah. Why? Because their experience enabled them to see and match and look at the consequences before we go into a certain behavior. So the hikmah would more be relating having the experience or the knowledge to know the consequence of something. And that would make up wisdom. So when you have wisdom, you have wisdom, it usually comes with time. Usually comes with time because that's the only way that, uh, that you were enabled to see the pattern of our actions and the different behaviors 
and the consequence and to avoid the evil consequence by doing the right thing. So you avoid an evil consequence by, by doing the right thing before time before it even happens. So that would be hikmah, hikmah, wisdom. Hamd is praise. Hamd general, generally, and that's why the word Muhammad means the praised one. But hamd in itself means praise. Hamd, a person deserving hamd or Allah deserving hamd would mean that he deserves praise, praise. Deen, there's actually a lot to say about the word deen, and notice that it appeared 92 times. Um, the word deen, um, there are two things to it. Yes, it does mean religion in general. Religion in general, it can be a false religion or a true religion. And what we mean by religion is any, um, any ideology or any idea that you carry or that you embrace, which involves that you consider such a philosophy or such an idea, regardless of it's true or not, that interprets life, the purpose of life, what is behind life. And based on that idea, based on that idea, you start, you start, um, let's say, putting your behavior into a certain practice. So let's, you know, really, really quick here. So when we look at Religion, well, religion doesn't come on its own, but religion in itself would develop into a law and understanding of how you should behave relating to the world around you. So the word deen, deen can mean religion, law, or judgment, or judgment. So there, all those would be included. And that's why in Islam, even atheism is a religion. Even atheism is a religion, although they would consider that they stay away from religion or don't want to be um, don't, want, don't want to be associated to a particular religion. But just because you had an idea about life and existence and aftermath of this life, etc., that would mean that you have a particular uh, religion. And because they would believe that there's no life, etc., then they would say life is matter in motion, and then they would say, well, let's create. Uh, let's uh, invent or create our own purpose for our, own, uh, for our existence, which later becomes the existentialism. All right, so we're not going to go into a harder category, but here, just to understand that deen, it starts out with the philosophy of your understanding, and then it becomes the action that you that you carry. So when we say, that, that appeared in Surah Yusuf, here is telling you that deen would mean the law, the constitution that the king had. So he wasn't going to uh, transgress the, the law that the king had already appointed or had already assigned. So he wasn't going to transgress the laws. All right, deen al malik, which tells you that you cannot in Islam separate between your behavior, the laws, the laws, then the the principles that you do within your behavior, and also the idea that you carry about principle and what defines truth, what defines um, what defines right and wrong, etc. All right, so this is just an idea about Dean zakah. Okay, the word zakah, zakah, is charity. But here's one thing, zakah actually comes from the root zakah which would mean to purify. So zakah would, uh, would give an impression that, that this is, this, yes, you got this money, but there is, there is a small amount within your money that may actually not be lawful for, uh, for you to take. So you purify yourself through zakah by giving 2.5% of your income that is past $3,913, at least for the year 2020. And you would do that purification, purification that your money or your income or your property might be involved in. So you purify that amount by giving it away just to make sure that you are 
you are um, free of any transgression within your money. So the word zakah would actually mean charity, but it would also mean purification. Shaheed or shuhada is a martyr or a witness. Okay. So a martyr or a witness. And what it means to be a martyr is to die for a certain noble cause. That would be the first type of shaheed. Um, uh, that shuhada would mean those nobles, those that a shaheed is one. And shuhada is plural. Those that had died for a noble and honorable cause would be the shaheed. They didn't just die, but they died for... Uh, a certain noble cause, and that is the shaheed. And here, the shaheed in Islam would actually be the mujahid only. It wouldn't be the rest of the people that were mentioned in the hadith. Shaheed can also mean witness, all right? So the person that is witnessing on a contract, a person that is witnessing a crime, so that would mean that witness, witnessing a situation in order to be that evidence to prove um, either the transgression over somebody's rights or the affirmation of somebody's rights, that I would have witnesses witness that I had bought that piece of land from X or Y, and therefore in the future, those people would be my witnesses, my evidence, my support that indeed I did buy this land. All right, so that would be the witness. And it can also uh, be here, you know, shuhada can also mean the same thing, where witness, witnesses, it's plural. You've got a plural and you have a singular. And notice that it was actually mentioned 56 times, so you definitely have to memorize that one. Salah, salah is prayer. That's an easy one. Salah is prayer. But one thing is that when we say salah, when we say salah, the word salah in initially actually meant a prayer, meaning an invocation meaning that you make the dua, okay, the invocation to, in, to invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but later it became specified only to mean the ritual, the five daily, the five daily prayers that later became salah. And in the Quran, when it's referring to salah, um, it is actually referring to the five daily prayers that we're speaking of. And um, when we speak about salah in general, it generally means just an invocation. Mubin, mubin meaning clear or self, self-expressor. It's obvious. So mubin is another word for it is obvious, obvious or clear. A very obvious, clear matter that it doesn't require more, um, doesn't require more evidences because it is so obvious. Nur means light. But here's one thing: the word nur is different than. Uh, the word light is different than uh, the other word where not all nur is the same because nur would mean that it doesn't actually light on itself, all right? But it is uh, it is actually reflecting another light. And that's why when you look at the, the sun, the sun and was talking about it, uh, was speaking about it as the siraj that, that makes the light. But when it spoke about the moon, it talked about it as nur, that it was reflecting light. So when you, even in the Quran, when it was talking about the mu'mineen in Surah Al-Hadid, and it was talking about, unzuruna naqtabis min nurikum, look at us, we are, we are naqtabis, we are, uh, the, the light that is coming out of you is reflecting on us. And then the ayah said, وَقِلَ رَجَعُ وَرَأَكُمْ Go back. You, you, can't, you can't be here. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts a door between them. So the word nur, it is more that it was a light that was reflecting from another light, from another source of light, let's say it that way. So that would be the nur. So when we speak about nur in general, think of it as reflecting light. Ahad and ihda. Ahad. So this is regarding ahad. Ahad would mean one, and ihda would mean one, but a female gender. Um, and and it would usually be relating to uh, the numbers. So number one. All right. Ilah and aliha. Ilah, whether it's a false deity or a true deity, in the end is that they have Aliha. They're deities that they worship. They're deities that they think are God. They think are 
uh, supposed to be holy anywhere they worship. But here's one thing, is that it's really important to mention that when we speak about Aliha, it could be the deity that one might worship. So it could be what one might worship. And it could be what they believe is the creator or the creator or what is behind this world. So Ilah and Aliha would be generally what one might worship and also what they believe is a creator. Now that's why in Islam, there is no difference between believing in Allah, the one worthy of worship, and between the creator. But for the uh, polytheists, they did differentiate. So they would believe the creator is one, but then they would go and worship something else. All right, But it would still be considered an ilah. It would still be considered a god or a deity, regardless of whether you thought that it was a creator, or whether you actually you actually considered it deserving worship. Um, sharik, sharik and shurakat, sharik and shurakat. Sharik would mean um, associate or partner, right? So an associate or partner. And when we speak about sharik, so when we say la sharik la, that there's no one. And in the Quran, it appears many times when we talk about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that He does not have any partners, which is to indicate that no one shares any of the any of the powers in the names of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So if you regard that somebody is Alamul Huyu, that somebody knows the future, well, that's when you had considered that somebody else shares that description. So when we say Sharik, that would mean that. They are believing that somebody shares that idea, that description, and somebody is a partner to the Lord Almighty. All right. And Shahada, notice here we did Shahid and Shahada. They actually come from the same root, but we'll explain root later on, inshallah, tomorrow. No, Saturday. No, today is Saturday. No, today is Monday. Shahada. All right. Shahada is witnessed. Arsh. Um, shahada is witnessed. So this is the actual um, adjective. Arsh is throne. Arsh is throne. So the throne itself, meaning slash, can also be the chair. But of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we say Arsh al-Rahman, we definitely do not think of do not think of an actual chair or a king chair. Um, because this is part of al ghaib This is part of al ghaib Oh, here's the word. al ghaib part of the unseen. All right. Ahd, unseen or hidden. Well, Ahd can also mean number of things actually Ahd can mean the promise the promise that um, you had made with someone and can also mean what I know about you so what we already know about something so the Ahd or what I would know in other words the integrity let's say it that way integrity um, meaning that they had fulfilled the promise and I know that a person's past was always such and such, meaning that type of integrity. And what I remember about them is such a habit. So that would be that. So just to tell you, it would have a number of meanings. And the way we would know the meaning is looking at the context. The context is going to give me an idea. So let me um, summarize the meanings for Ahd. So Ahd would mean the promise. And Ahd would mean what you know about somebody, the information that you know about somebody, and would also mean integrity. Okay, integrity. I know I have sloppy handwriting. All right, now, Ghaib unseen. Ghaib unseen. And when we say Ghaib, um, although here unseen, but then we look at the context. Notice that it appeared 49 times. And Ghaib that it, it's always غيب السماوات والأرض but there are instances where for example حافظات للغيب بما حافظ الله well definitely it's not talking about حافظات للغيب that she memorized that there are ملائكة that there's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are prophets that's not حافظات للغيب is not referring to that but then it's referring to what others are not uh, are not uh, aware of or observant to so here it's talking about the home um of course, at least in the A. But ghaib in general, anything that is um, anything that is unseen. And what we mean by unseen, unseen could be the malaika, could be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, could be something in the past as well. So not always is it referring to what we can never see, you know, through, with our naked eye, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, malaika, etc. But it could also be something that happened 
in in the past or something happened now but you were not present all right so you were not present and it happened it could be right now so right now i'm sitting here but i don't really know what salwa is doing in her home that's part of life i'm not present i'm not able to observe it i'm not able to know um, what is happening that becomes life so i see meaning you cannot see it whether because you are not observing it or whether because it is something that your um your body is not going to be able to see it as Allah and the Malaika. Kitab and Kutub. So Kitab and Kutub. This would be the singular and this would be a plural. So Kitab would mean book. Kutub would mean books. So there's one book and books. But when we look at the book with the word Kitab and Kutub books, um, in the Quran, we notice that it appeared 261 times. All right. And, and therefore, it's really important to say that not always is it referring to, for example, Quran or etc. It can also refer to scripture. So kitab or kutub can refer to a scripture. So when it talks about ahlil kitab, it's referring to the people of the scripture, the people that had a scripture, regardless of it being edited, modified, reinterpreted, etc. In the end is that they have a scripture that they go back to. All right. So book or slash scripture. All right. Or slash scripture. And kalima, kalima would mean word. In the Indo-Pakistani, they call kalima for the Allah. And kalima. 42 times it would mean word. Kalima can also mean, it doesn't necessarily mean a word per se, it can also mean a sentence. Um, a, a sentence or a phrase or a clause. So it can mean word, phrase, clause, sentence, all that can mean kalima. All right, kalima, and it appeared 42 times, kalima. And malak or malaika. The word malak is singular, and malaika are angels angels or angels is malaika and malak is an angel and we know that for malak and malaika um there there are definitely you know different different religions that do believe in angels and their existence and um all that and from uh even the 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 pagan arabs they did also believe in angels but they believe that angels were the girls of allah and that's why the ayah was actually saying, you know, are you affirming or considering that 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 boys go back to you, but girls go back to Allah? Um, mithaq is a covenant or a treaty, and in mithaq would in, in the Quran would actually usually appear as the con the covenant or the treaty or the promise uh, between Allah subhanahu wa taala that connection that bond. Here's another word, the bond between Allah and the prophets and the messengers. Okay, so that is the, the, the bond between Allah and the prophets and the messengers. Only once, and in the Quran, it actually called the bond between a husband and a wife as a strong bond. All right, as a strong bond. So it kind of gave that impression that the strong bond between husband and wife is like the bond between Allah and the prophets and the messengers. All right, so one. Wahid and Wahid. And you might say, well, we've got Ahad right here. So what's the difference? They actually go back to the same root and go back to the same root, Ahad and Wahid and Wahid. Wahid would mean one. Straightforward. There's no complication. One. Just one. All right. Let's go ahead with um, with uh, column 12 in where it is discussing deeds, people's actions. And when we speak about people's actions, we're going to talk about A'mal. Actions, deeds, behaviors. A'mal. Amal and the the singular of it is actually amal. Amal is the singular for it. Hasana, hasana or hasanat. Hasana um, would mean good deed in specific. It's more of a deed, but hasan or something hasan is actually something that is good. Ali ibn Abi Talib actually named hasan. Um, named him harb in the beginning, but then the Prophet Sallam, the Prophet Sallam changed hasan's name from. Harb, which means war or battle, to Hassan to mean good, All right? Hassan or Hassana, and Hassanet. Hassana is the singular one, and Hassanet would mean the plural. It's here referring to just good deeds in general, good deeds in general, whatever good deed that you do, it's Hassana, and it is. It is here important to mention that what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions it as Hassana would mean that it is good, meaning that that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is affirming that that action is actually a good behavior. And the opposite of hasana is sayya. And that appeared 68 times. So when we say that the Quran referred to it as sayya, that it is evil, 
or plural sayyat that they are sayyat that they are evil would actually tell us that this is the ruling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had referred to. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Qawm Lut, for example, calls it Fahisha or Sayya, or, or even calls the action in terms that refers to that behavior as being evil or not good, then that would actually tell us that this is one way where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is determining that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is determining that this is uh, this is what this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is regarding it as it would be regarded as evil, as wrongdoing. So sayyia would be the singular and sayyiat would be the plural. Khair, khair is better or good. So khair, how do I know if it's good or better? You'd look at the context. If the context is telling you that that is khair, then that would mean that that's good. But if it is comparing or giving you uh, some superiority, then that would actually mean that that is better. Sharr would mean evil. And you can see here in the Quran that there's khair and sharr, and it more talked about good than talked about evil. Hmm, something to consider. And more talked about good than actually talked about evil. But here's one thing, is that what do we get out of the word khair and sharr? That relativity in Islam does not exist. At least in when we're talking about when we're talking about behavior and if something is good or bad. Ithm and dhanb and junah. You can see right here, ithm, dhanb, and junah. Right? The difference between these. They're, they all mean sin, but they actually they actually have slight differences in the meaning. Um, let's start with junah. We're going to start with that one. Junah. Junah would more, yes, it means sin, but it also means to transgress the limit. So junah would mean a transgression. And ithm, ithm would mean more as a sin. So ithm would mean sin, and junah would mean more into sin slash transgression. And the difference between that is that there is a borderline, and you had crossed that borderline. That's when you had committed a transgression. Ithm, ithm would be a sin, would be a sin. The difference between transgression and sin. So this is, this is talking about that there was a limit to it. Then and the noob. Then is 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 it's like having that there, there's a trace to it, so that there's a, a sin that traces back, and it's still following you. All right, and that's why there's the thenab. Thenab would mean tail, and then it's it comes from that idea in where it is still tracing, it is still accompanying you. The effect of that particular sin is still present, and it is a sin. But it is accompanying the influences, the impact are still there. So you look at those terms to go deep. Where do I see it in? Ithm and then and junah. Although, like I said, they all mean sin. But each, each one actually carries a different connotation. Haram would mean unlawful. And haram would mean very similar to junah because it is more of a, of a transgression. But haram would mean that the person had not only committed a transgression, but they went into the zone of uh, the, the zone that is a noble zone or a zone that is a dangerous zone. So it could be two sides to it. It could be a noble zone or it could be a dangerous zone. So that, uh, that would mean haram and that's where unlawful. When you look at haram, think of the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ actually says al-halal ubayin wal haram ubayin. Halal is clear and Haram is clear, and between them, there's that red line that there are certain areas that are gray. That's where, and then the hadith continues and says that uh, every single king has this area of what is the security area to watch out to make sure that no one is um, is harming or is transgressing the security or the guard that he had considered as his own his own uh, property or his own what is the word but uh, the the own his, the area that he owns or the area that he rules over so that considers haram is basically that area where you transgress you go out there's a certain zoning. Right, that would be haram that you have transgressed the limit. Ism and asma. Ism and asma. So ism would mean the singular, 
and asma would be the plural. Ism and asma. Now, one thing is that when we say ism, ism, it would really be the particular word that we use to identify different matters or different people or different things from others. So that would be that defining article for the ism, it, the name what you use in order to call or identify a specific item. Asma would be plural. It's mentioned 27 times. Well, we would actually for sure, we would say it's definitely more than that because that's 114 times mentioned in the Quran. So the word ism definitely appears more than 27 times. All right, so ism and asma just went by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'll tell you in the name of Allah, it was more than that. Hadith and hadith. Hadith and hadith. This would be the singular and this would be the plural. Singular and plural. And when, when you see the word hadith, it's about speaking about a speech. It's talking about somebody said something. There was a, a certain uh, matter that was said, and a hadith would be the plural of it. And this is singular, and this is plural. Okay. Now it's really important to mention that when it talks about a certain specific speech, um, many times when we speak about hadith and a hadith, it's basically what was said just what was said it doesn't necessarily refers to it doesn't always refer to as a discourse you know the, the discourse the uh, the rhetoric sometimes it can refer to rhetoric that it the rhetoric would more be associated with the word mala mala when it's a rhetoric so in mala we're going to get to that word we're going to get to that word later on i know it's in the other box but generally speaking in mala would be the kind of like the media today where it's you know the the heads of the people are the chieftains the the chieftains have decided and then it becomes the common saying everybody else is everybody else is using that same idea so one person spreads a rumor spreads an idea and that idea becomes the idea that everybody else embraces and it becomes the rhetoric that everybody else is repeating all right and that would be the hadith that would be the speech, the discourse, the, the talk that, that is there. All right? Tayyiba and tayyiba. Good. But tayyiba would more be, when we say tayyib, um, would mean pure. And this is so beautiful to say. I mean, when you look at the word, um, there's a, a certain purity. The, the pure men are for pure women. And this is referring to marriage. The opposite of tayyib is actually khabith. Khabith, all right. So the tayyib, the opposite of it, al khabith. But with the word tayyib, like I said, would mean pure or good, meaning that it doesn't, it didn't get contaminated. And that's why when we look at tayyibuna li tayyibat, that they didn't get contaminated. They didn't get contaminated with the other ill behaviors, illicit behaviors that others are embracing. And that's why they're tayyib. They're tayyib, meaning they're pure. They are still on the beautiful instinct that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created them in. So tayyib would generally mean pure, halal, or it can also mean tayyib would mean pure when we're talking about food. That akl uh, tayyibat, for example, eating tayyib, pure things that are not contaminated, and they're not contaminated, or things that are not contaminators, if that is even a word. So they don't contaminate you. If we're talking about akl uh, tayyib, you're eating pure things that are not contaminating you because those contaminators can affect you. Um, and here's a question. Are those numbers on the side how many times the word appears in the Quran? Right. That's supposed to be how many words, but don't trust it fully uh, because uh, I did see that some of those numbers are not accurate. Just like this. We can't, I mean, there's no way that the word ism appeared 27 times when we already know that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim appeared 114 times. Um, even though Sukhita Tawbah doesn't have one, but, uh, but you will have in... But still, we would know that the word ism appeared more than that. But um, just an idea with the numbers of how many times it appeared. Um, so tayyib would mean pure. And tayyibat is the plural of that pure. We are staying away from that contamination. Ala are favors. And you know, and that appeared in Surah Al-Rahman 34 times. Or 31 or 34? Can't remember exactly. Ala favors but when we look at ala not always is it favors because it would also mean blessings blessings there well yeah well favors and blessings somehow they are very similar in ways but ala sultan sultan would mean 
not the sultan, not the sultan here that we have in, my, in our Mayans where it's got a little turban and a little, a little um, gem over his turban. No, that, that's not what this is referring to. Sultan would mean any authority or any warrant or any power. All right, so, um, so or even uh, sultan can also mean um, evidence. So in sultan, what sultan, what epistemology actually is the word. So authority, evidence, um, warrant, authority, and that would be the sultan. Okay, don't think of sultan the kind that we were that we have in our in our mind about you know wearing a turban, sitting on a throne, and with a big huge ring on his finger. Fadl grace. But here's one thing. By the way, it, it says grace, but fadl actually can also mean remainder. So what does that mean? It think of this. Think of that you have an abundant amount even more than what you need, all right? That would be fadl. That, that remainder part, that is, because it's so abundant that you've got extra and more than what you need, that's the grace or that's the blessing or that's the fadl. You've got an abundant amount, even more than what you need, and that would be il fadl. So the remaining, the remaining part, the remainder of a blessing. Me, water. All right. It could also mean slash liquid. So water or liquid. All right. Any liquid would be me. All right. And mulk, mulk would mean um, the Ryan. So dominion, ownership, um, property could also all of it be mulk. Mulk. When you own something, the ownership could also, yeah, ownership. <coughs> Nema. Nema would be very similar to Anna, by the way. So Nema would be um, it's a blessing and a favor. So you can see that here it said Anna, and that's plural. And and Nema, Nema would be a favor. Ajma'un, Ajma'un, and Ajma'in. And that the reason why they would be different is because of the different part of speech. So that would uh, that would be so it's a grammatical difference. That's a little more advanced than this. Ajma'un and Ajma'in would mean all. Ajma'un would mean combined. So they are combined together. And that's why they're ajma. They're combined together. So they became all of them. But they are combined. They are somehow united together relating this matter, whether it's good or evil. Ithn is permission. Ithn is permission. Ithn. And that's why we talk about udhun, which would mean ear, meaning that they, it was heard, it was it was considered. And uh, yep, so it is actually the same the same timing. Even is permission. Um, even is permission. So there's a permission to do something, meaning that the person is allowed to do it. That, that is punishment. Oh, sorry, my bad. Not punishment. That is power and adversity. But here's one thing. That can also mean can also mean that there is there is something not acceptable in it. Um, so we could say. It can also mean power. That the, per the one has bas, meaning that they have power. And it could also mean that there is bas in that matter, the meaning that there's going to be a punishment, um, meaning that it's a transgression. All right? So when we look at it, the way we would know whether it's talking about power or whether it's talking about punishment is really the context. The context is going to tell us how to differentiate between these matters. And there are different ways to, other than other than the context, but you know, that, that's a totally different totally different route to go to. But just in general, just remember that bets can, can refer to power, uh, some kind of authority that one has. All right. And when we say la bats alaik would mean that, you know, it's okay. There, you know, although there may be some transgression, but we're gonna let go. So this is la bats alaik. It's not saying, you know, I'm just hoping that you would have no power. But here, no, la ba'sa alayk would mean that there is, uh, la ba'sa alayk means there is no harm. There's no harm happening to you. So you could see that, you know, ba's can mean power and can mean harm. And because harm itself can actually have power over you in the end, can overcome different things. Jamia, jamia, similar to ajma'un. And it would mean that also united, there are groups that are united, and they are these groups as united groups. Now they have become 
all of them. So it, so it, so it would mean same, equal, and level. So what that would mean when we're talking about so it, we're talking about a pattern. All right. In the Quran, pattern is very common in the Quran, where it's you know telling you about the commonality between the past and the future, the commonality between different items that are created around us in the world, and would also mean so it, and where it's comparing even people. It's comparing actions. It's comparing, uh, it's comparing uh, different uh, understandings. So there's always that comparison, all right? Because it doesn't consider everything to be equal, because not everything is equal. So then it would give you, it would give you that comparison. So most of the times when it's talking about salat in the Quran, it will tell you to use that comparison tool and to compare: are these two equal? Are these two the same? So it's talking about yes, we. Are they comparable? Are they on the same level? Do you even consider them to be the equal? It can't be the same. So here, sawa in itself, just the word itself, would actually mean equal or on the same level. All right, sawa, and can also mean sawa. So when we're talking about sawa is we're talking about a balanced root, and this is really important because in the Quran it talks about sawa is um, a, 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 a root that is balanced. So when we live our life, we live our life with balanced behaviors, with balanced choices, in where we don't let our own transgressions, our own inclinations rule and, and, and mentor our behavior, but we decide based on balanced, balanced understanding of what is good for me and what is wrong, etc. And then I would also consider making the balance between the decision that I make, my inclinations, what I, I would like to do, and the, the the influences or even the consequences, let's say it that way, and how it will impact me. Fariq, so this is Fariq. Fariq would mean party or group and team. When we say team, so it talks about a lot of teams. That there are people that join together on a shared Per, for a shared purpose, for a shared, for a common uh, purpose, or uh, uh, for a common uh, action, and do the same thing, and those would be fariq. And this is really important to think about, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would tell you to think of and ask yourself, who's fariq are you on? Who are you part of? Are you fariq on fariq on fariq on fariq There's a, a group, there's a party, there's a team uh, that they were united on a particular matter, particular purpose. They shared a common culture and therefore they would be in Jannah or in Hellfire. And that's something for everyone to think of. You know, do I share more of the culture of maybe the deviant groups, or do I more share culture, practice, um, wishes, aims, goals, disciplines, etc., with the salihin or with the other people? Who do I share with? And that's why, you know, it is amazing how the Prophet ﷺ was always talking about the different things in, in our life, even if it involved the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you, you know, many times people would ask me, is piercing halal or haram? And it's like, well, you, you know, let me, let me ask you this. Do you feel that this makes you fit in part of the salihin or part of the fasidin? It's, you know, we can't, we can't separate the action, the action from the, the effect and the influences that it has on your heart. I know you, you're like, okay, here we're going into a ma'adha in the meaning class or the vocabulary class. Let's talk about the relatives, all right? Relatives, and here we go, we got mother. This is singular and this would be plural, so mother. But one thing is that mother in the Arabi, in, in the Arabi culture doesn't necessarily mean mother per se, meaning the woman that is the biological mother who bore that child, but can also mean uh, the base of something, the foundation of something. So when when we talk about umhat and um, it most of the times it will talk about the the bearer, meaning the person that bear uh, bared that child or bore that child, um, to be more accurate. Um, but it can also mean like um al kitab, for example, um al kitab. It doesn't mean that there was a mother that you know had the baby child called kitab or that is book, but no, it's talking about um, meaning the foundation, right? 
So mother or slash foundation of something. And let's go for ab and abati. All right. And ab and abati. Abati would more be relating to, and it would only appear two times really. Abati, two times or once. And ab would be the father. So just as this would mean foundation, same thing with ab, it would mean also the foundation. So both um and ab would mean the foundation and can also mean the actual father who bore that child. Zawj and azwaj. Zawj and azwaj. Zawj would be the plural, no, the singular. And azwaj would be the plural. So zawj and azwaj. And you could see zawj would mean pair as well. Sometimes it can mean the wife and the husband, but it can also mean pair, mean male and female. And pair, when we talk about pairs as male, female, we could see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything in a certain pattern of male and female as a pattern. Um, rajul would be the singular, and Brijal would be the plural of men. So Rajul would mean one man, and Brijal, men. All right, Imra'a, Imra'a would mean woman. There's no other way to interpret it, it's just woman. And the plural of one woman is Nisa. Okay, Imra'a and Nisa. I know it has nothing to do with the same root, but Imra'a is one woman, and Nisa is a group of women. Walad and Awlad. Walad would mean one boy or one. And every Kudu Walud and Walad, so every whatever that father, mother, um, whatever they uh, have begotten would be considered Walad. And Awlad would be the plural. Walad is one, Awlad is more than one. Walid would be the parents. Okay? Walid would be, uh, Walidain, sorry. Walidain would be the parents, and Walid would be the father. Meaning the Right? Riyya. This is all relatives, by the way. Riyya, the descendants. Those that go back to a particular biological parent or two parents would be the Riyya. Ibn is son. Ibn is son. Banun, Banin, Abna. They all mean the same thing. And the reason why they are different is depending on the part of speech. So Banun, Banin, and Abna would be the plural and they are generally sons. Akh and Akhu and Akha and Akhi are all meaning brother, but it depends on the part of speech. And Ikhwan would mean the same thing. So we've got Akh and Ikhwan. It would mean brothers. We're going to end right here. What should we what should we do wedge and body parts really quick? So the body parts that appear, wedge or wuju would mean face, ayn or ayun would mean an eye or a spring. Look at that. By the way, the word ayn actually has more meanings than that just to tell you. It can also mean spy. It can mean so many different things. But in the Quran, it only, as to what I remember, it only comes as to mean an eye or a spring. A spring to mean spring of water. Not spring meaning the season, but spring of water. Absar sights and absar when we speak about sight, um, it can uh, it can mean the actual eye that sees, and it can also mean the insight. So to see beyond the surface, that would be an insight. Afwa mouths. I know it's so hard English to say mouths. Um, mouths meaning afwa meaning more than one mouth, and because fem would be one mouth. Afwa would mean many mouths. Lisan and alsina. Lisan would mean one tongue and alsina would mean tongues. And one thing is that, uh, for example, اختلافو alsinatikum. It's not that people have different tongues, but here it's referring, it's a, it's more of a metaphor and to mean different languages. Okay, so it can mean tongue and it can also mean language. So more of a metaphor, but it can also be to mean different languages. Qalb, singular, and qulub is plural. And you can see it's amazing how, it you know, 132 times for the word qalb in the Quran. And you got yad, which would mean hand. You know, it's, it's really amazing to look at these numbers and actually see, you know, how many times it referred to it and its importance. So qalb and qulub. So qalb would be the singular and qulub would be the plural and would mean heart. By the way, it can mean heart and it can mean slash, slash um, it can mean the core of something too. The core of something. So qalb, when we speak about the core of an apple, um, we're not necessarily talking about the qalb, you know, that uh, that piece of, uh, piece of uh, or, you know, heart. Kind of like a, what we know that a pumps blood. Okay, but no, it can mean the core of something too. So the core of something as well. And qulub, same thing. So in the Quran, when it talks about heart or qalb, it is not necessarily like the ayah was saying that they have qulub la yafqahuna, la yafqahun biha. So wait a minute. Does 
the heart actually do this the thinking or is it the brain so anything that is a core can be referring to the brain core as the core that would mean that this is the core it does it's not necessarily talking about that actual gland that pumps blood and those um th those uh sides to it but it's actually talking about a core of something the core that they're they're deep on the inside the core of it uh is what it's referring to Sadr, and it's talking about the breast but breast or slash chest um in the quran when it talks about Sadr, it's a different thing than qalb and same thing, it's a different than, than ruh. I do have a lecture in where I explain the difference between qalb, sadr, and ruh. To make the story short, it ruh is is the, the soul or the spirit way inside. The sadr and qalb, uh, the sadr is relating to one's Islam, but the qalb would more be relating to one's iman. So it's a different uh, a different level. And the ruh would be relating to one's fu'ad, one's fu'ad meaning the, core, the deeper core, all right? This is uh, you know, just a rough thing. Qalb uh, and qulub. So qalb would mean a core of something and or cores of something, which is the plural. Sadr and sudur, breast or slash chest. All right? But it's not referring to the chest per se, meaning it doesn't necessarily speak about it in terms of sadr meaning talking about a body part. It many times can be a metaphor to mean the middle of something. All right? The middle of something. So sadr can also mean the middle of something. The main space of something. Yad and AD can mean hand and can sometimes be that yad can, um, so here's the, here's the plural, can also mean that metaphor to it which would speak about power or the authority or the ability to give orders. Okay, so that would be the yad as well. So just keep that in mind in where it's talking about yad and AD. Yad would be singular and AD would be plural. Rijl and arjun. Rijl would mean one leg. And arjul would mean foot. So here it said, uh, oh, sorry, arjul would mean legs. Um, rijal does not actually mean foot, but it, uh, the rijal would actually mean um, would mean leg in general. And and it can and arjul. So فاغسلوا جوهكم وأيديكم إلى مرافق وامسحوا برؤوسكم وأرجلكم إلى الكعبين. أرجلكم in this a would mean foot. All right, but you're going to look at it in the context. Rijl and nafs and anfus. And here it's talking about soul, but in nafs, in nafs would have many meanings, really. Um, but the nafs itself, like the soul itself, has all those powers, all those powers to uh, mentor or determine a lot of your actions. So anfus would be the plural, nafs would be one. Ruh. And scholars, you know, look at, look at the nafs 293 times. Ruh would be the soul and spirit. Ruh would more be relating to that that, um, that peace within our bodies that can bring us to life or death, right? And the nafs would have more implications than just that piece of it. It, it can be used as to mean the ruh as well. It depends on the context. Quwa, power or strength. Quwa, power or strength. All right, that's it for today. Be happy to answer any questions. And well, next week, inshallah, it's going to be um, box 14. And of course, we're going to go for the more complex side of it. And um, there's that question box. So that's right. And that pattern. And we are close to finishing, inshallah. So we've got 14 boxes and 38 boxes. So we're almost halfway. And Jazakumullah khairan, everybody. If there's any questions, be happy to answer any questions. Um, so if there are any questions. All right, so it looks like there's there aren't any questions. And Zahra S, you were uh, the highest, you were the, the one to get the highest grade. And mashallah, you did great, outstanding. And that was uh, that was a good job, mashallah. I was so happy to hear that. And 